Hello, today we will be talking about the shader technology or writing programs for the graphic processor of your graphics card. This lecture is divided into two parts. In this first part, we will be looking into extensions in OpenGL and the route to the new brave world of the programmable pipeline or shaders. Uh, this uh, part will also include preparation of GLSL programs. Uh, GLSL is the programming language we'll be using for writing shader programs. The language itself, as well as uh, uh, some practical examples of uh, shader programs, will be included in part two. To get the most of this lecture, you should have watched our previous lecture materials on, uh, on matrices, and they're used to specify uh, spatial transformations, as well as uh, the VBOs, the only right way of specifying objects in uh, OpenGL. Uh, uh, the links uh, to these uh, lectures should either be displayed somewhere on the screen, or if they are not there, in the description below this uh, video. Anyway, I will provide a quick reminder of a VBO technique because it is quite crucial in terms of your understanding of uh, shaders. So VBO, Vertex Buffer Objects, are the buffer objects or the arrays of vertex normal and index data as you can see uh, them uh, here coded in C++. What's so special that they uh, even got a special name of uh, VBO? The special about VBO is that uh, these buffers are sent over to the graphics card, stored in the graphics card memory, so that they can be directly accessed by the GPU, the graphical processor of the graphics card. Um, it's important because this means that you only need to prepare this data once on your computer, send them once to the graphics card, and then they can be repeatedly many times used by the graphics card to render your objects. So first of all, uh, our VBO here consists of uh, uh, three different arrays, buffer arrays. The first array are the vertex coordinates. Uh, each triplet of numbers here represents x, y, z coordinates of a single vertex of a 3D model of some object. Uh, the second uh, table uh, on the array uh, contains uh, the normal coordinates and again each triplet contains uh, or, uh, reflects one normal. Uh, the index buffer, the third buffer, provides the indices to the vertices, uh, so vertex indices, that instruct the graphics card how to create uh, triangular meshes. So, for example, the first triangle will be created of uh, vertex 0, 1, 2. So, that's uh, 0, 1, 2, nine first numbers uh, creating three times x, y, z coordinates, so a uh, triangle. The next triangle will be created out of three, four, five, and so on. Uh, they don't have to be consecutive numbers, as you can see in this um, area here. Uh, there is a small distortion to that. Okay, so that's one of the possible, uh, possible representations of uh, 3D meshes. For more representations, you can always watch uh, the lecture about uh, VBOs. Uh, once you have defined this uh, data in typical uh, application, uh, this data will not be stored, will not be defined within your source code. They will be typically loaded from a, a 3D mesh uh, file, from an external file somewhere. Okay? Um, the point is that you need to have provided uh, data on the vertices, normals, and indices. And now in the next stage, uh, and this would uh, usually be in some kind of initialization function, uh, we have to pack these data and uh, send them over to the graphics card. 
So first of all, we need the names, so-called the names of VBOs, uh, which are in fact unsigned numbers, but uh, in OpenGL we call them a, num uh, a name. So firstly, we will prepare the vertex data by generating a buffer. So generation of buffer is actually providing a name, so a number, usually just a consecutive number to the uh, variable vertex buffer that will be used subsequently to identify this particular uh, buffer. Then we bind buffer. Binding buffer is the operation of notifying OpenGL that we are going to use this particular uh, buffer. Okay, uh, basically uh, declaring anything uh, as uh, the right object to use, whether it is a buffer or a texture, is in OpenGL terminology called binding. And uh, as you should know by now, OpenGL is a uh, state machine. So once you set up an object, bind an object as the right object to be used, it will remain the current, the bound object until you change it by binding another object at some moment in the future. So we created the buffer name, we bound the buffer, and this line uh, of code here is to send the data over to the graphics card. So we uh, provide, uh, we have to provide some instruction to OpenGL specifying what kind of a buffer it is, so-called array buffer. Uh, we have to specify the size of this uh, buffer, so size of the vertices array, uh, the pointer, so that OpenGL knows where to look for this data, and this uh, GL static draw is additional instruction for OpenGL uh, specifying that uh, the information, the data we send will be used for static drawing. So we will not, uh, first of all, we will not read this, date, this data back from the graphics card. And they will not be modified during the, the use. So once they are sent, they will be just used for rendering. We uh, repeat the very similar procedure for the normal data, so another three instructions, and for the index data with one very small but very significant uh, difference. An index array is a slightly different type of an array, so instead of GL array buffer, we have to specify that this is GL element array buffer just for OpenGL to know that the use of this array is slightly different. These are indices specifying the meshes, the triangular meshes, not uh, just the vertex data. Okay, so this is something you have to do just once during the initialization, uh, just after starting your program or a game. Um, it may take some time if you have huge uh, buffers, but the good point is that once you have done it, your data is uh, safely saved in the graphics card ready for rendering. And how to render this data? This is the renderer for the VBO. Uh, this is non-shader version, so fixed function shader. We will change this code in the, the subsequent part of this lecture. Uh, but what you should have learned in your VBO lecture is that uh, this is the code to be performed during the uh, render, each render uh, cycle, so probably in some kind of a render function. So we have to enable arrays, so specify to the OpenGL that we are going to use a vertex array and a normal array. And then this is the same function that we used uh, previously, bind a buffer. So this is specifying to the OpenGL that we are going to use this particular buffer, the vertex buffer, okay? And then we have to tell which data within the buffer we want to render. Uh, we do that because we can send a uh, larger, larger uh, buffer, and then we can choose just segment of segments of this buffer to be uh, rendered. Uh, but in this case, uh, this vertex pointer will provide the pointer to the vertex data. We specify that this uh, vertex data will be triplets of 
GL float values, so basically x, y, z coordinates. Uh, please keep in mind that uh, OpenGL can also do 2D graphics, and with 2D graphics we would send two numbers, two coordinates per vertex. Um, and uh, these two zeros, uh, basically you can you can learn more details about these parameters in the other lecture, in the VBO lecture, but for now it's important for us that this is uh, the start, the beginning of the, of the buffer, so we will read data from the beginning of the buffer. And we repeat a very similar procedure for the normal buffer. And finally, please note that uh, uh, we don't have to specifically set up a pointer for the index buffer. We will do it in a different way. But we have to bind the index buffer if we, if we use it. Uh, again, a small difference versus a slightly different type of the buffer. So we have to provide this information when we bind the buffer, index buffer. And now the GL draw element is a function which will draw triangles uh, based on 18 consecutive vertices uh, using the index approach. So uh, the uh, vertices will be indexed. Each index will be an unsigned integer. And we start from the index number zero in our buffer. So that's uh, basically how this uh, rendering is uh, performed. At the very end, we have to disable arrays. That's uh, a kind of a cleaning procedure. We will specify that we will be not any longer use vertex and normal arrays. So this was a quick, uh, not so quick, but uh, it's hard to to explain uh, more briefly. Uh, so a brief reminder about uh, the VBOs. And now. The new Brave world moving to programmable pipeline. All we did, all, all programming we did so far in Open in OpenGL, was based on so-called fixed programming. So here is a small animation that I once showed you in uh, another lecture. Uh, metaphor of OpenGL development. So this is these are early years of OpenGL. Then OpenGL was developed uh, by creating a lot of fixed functions that did some kind of functionality. People were very happy to use this. It worked quite nicely, but these fixed functions didn't work so well with constantly changing architecture of modern graphics cards. Um, therefore, they have been all removed. Okay, and this is the process of deprecation. So uh, many, many, many functions, many functions that we have used in uh, the uh, workshop program last week, okay, are now deprecated, and we will try to avoid them. We will try not to use them any more. But why they were deprecated? To create space for new extensions and shaders. So sh shaders are a kind of an extension of OpenGL, a new functionality. To provide this new functionality, uh, creators of OpenGL, the Kronos Group, decided to remove a lot of older uh, functionality, which is uh, incompatible with the new shader technology or even, I would say, a philosophy of shader programming. So basically what shaders are also known as programmable pipeline, because this is, this is exactly what shaders are. Uh, this means that some essential stages of the graphics pipeline are now programmed directly in your GPU, graphics processing unit, the heart of your graphics card. And you've seen uh, so far how we can create VBOs, so uh, buffers of vertex data, and send them directly to the GPU. Now, uh, this was the third step. The second step will be we will also specify what our own programs that will use this data previously sent to the graphics card, use this data to create the rendered image. So, oh. 
shader is the program for the GPU, all right? So programmable uh, pipeline is the technology of using programs sent to the GPU, and these programs are called shaders. And uh, now, uh, this is a diagram that I showed you in, uh, I think, the first lecture in this 3D uh, technology series. And this is the graphical pipeline, a sequence of graphical operations performed by the graphics card in order to create uh, the, uh, the image, to render the image. And now what we do, we replace some stages of this uh, pipeline with programmable shaders. So uh, the previous generation of OpenGL, like this, was all fixed, okay? There was fixed operation, you could uh, configure this operation by using fixed functions. Now you have a lot more flexibility because some aspects, some uh, stages of this graphical pipeline have been removed completely and replaced by um, shaders. So a chance for you to write your own program that would instruct the GPU how to process data. Uh, there are uh, two main shaders that we will be talking about, vertex shader and fragment shader, so another part of this uh, pipeline. In fact, we have even more than that, and uh, here is the modern programmable pipeline, and with the purple color, I'm showing here various shaders, and uh, the fixed, so fi fixed part of this pipeline, so the parts which we cannot program, we can configure them in, in, in some way, but basically we still use fixed functions to uh, to cope with them are shown here in yellow. As you can see, this looks like a majority of the whole route is now uh, programmable. There is uh, one big obvious, I think, benefit, advantage of this situation, and this advantage is you have total freedom. You can do everything. You can do f really fantastic uh, special effects by writing programs directly for the GPU. A disadvantage is that uh, um, 3D graphics programming with OpenGL is no longer so easy as it was. I'm not sure if you think what you've done so far in uh, fixed pipeline was uh, indeed easy, uh, but uh, compared to what you are going to do now, it was much simpler and much easier. Uh, the simple truth is that when you once you switch to the shader shaders or programmable pipeline, your image will disappear, and this will be your experience very very soon when you start the uh, practical exercise and you will start. Uh, implementing your shader. Why? Because there is no replacement for these shaders. So you are expected to write at least a simple shader, which will at least provide the very basic processing of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, transforms, of vertices, and uh, elementary light, okay? Ele elementary lighting. Uh, without uh, these fixed parts and without providing the shader, OpenGL does not provide any kind of uh, default lighting model. Everything you have to write on by yourself. Fortunately, this is not so complicated and uh, even if uh, uh, the simplest possible uh, vertex shader still has some code in it, okay, it's like 20 lines of code, something like that. It's not terribly complicated. And once you start, you will just develop this further and further and use mostly benefits, advantages of the situation than disadvantages. Okay, moving on. The new brave world of uh, shaders includes uh, four different types of shaders, and in this module we'll be mostly talking about the vertex shader and the fragment shader. The pixel shader is another name for the same thing. Pixel shader is used uh, is the name used by Microsoft for the fragment shader, but the same thing in OpenGL world is called fragment shader. Uh, 
Uh, vertex shaders and fragment shaders are two shaders that you must provide because uh, the system will not provide any default equivalent for this uh, for this uh, for this uh, stage. Okay, uh, there are other uh, shaders like tessellation shader geometry shader which are optional so you don't have to provide them if you don't provide them then the pipeline will provide uh, the standard the default uh, processing for these stages uh, we can use one of several different languages unfortunately none of uh, well-known uh, languages the reason for that is that we are now programming for a highly specialized, highly parallel structure uh, architecture, which has a structure which is uh, very different from the traditional structure of traditional uh, processors. Okay, so from now on, we will always think about okay, a general programming game game engine and so on is the CPU, central processing unit, the heart of your PC of your computer or any other machine, uh, console, phone, or whatever. And then you have the GPU, the graphics processor, processing unit. And this graphics processing unit needs different languages. You can see these uh, languages in the slide. Um, GLSL, HLSL, CG, uh, game console may have their own uh, solutions. Uh, the important message here is this. All these languages or at least all languages I've ever heard about are very closely based on the C language. So uh, the learning curve is not very steep. It's quite steep, but it's not very steep because you can use all everything you know about the uh, syntax of the C language. It's not C++ because there's absolutely no point to uh, define objects, classes, this kind of object-oriented programming. Uh, in uh, the graphics card and when you start programming uh, in GLSL you will understand why. The reason is first of all because it has to be incredibly efficient and uh, shader programs are usually quite short so this is not a good environment for object-oriented programming. Now GLSL, uh, OpenGL shading language is the language that is used as a standard in OpenGL and the language we'll be using in this module and learn in this module. HLSL is a Microsoft language uh, used by Microsoft in DirectX related uh, solutions. Uh, there is also a very nice attempt of creating a multi-platform language called CG uh, from uh, NVIDIA. Uh, unfortunately, this language is not uh, continued, it's discontinued by uh, the NVIDIA company. Okay, so we have the vertex shader and the fragment shader, and the question is what they do, what is the real function in the system. So let's have a look again at the uh, OpenGL pipeline and the position of these two shaders in this pipeline. As you can see, the vertex shader is at the very top. So the vertex shader gets the row vertex and attribute data, row vertex coordinates, row normal coordinates, and so on. Um, the important point about the vertex shader is that this is a program which will be performed for each vertex, so a 3D point x, y, z separately. Okay, So you write a short program, then if your uh, image has, uh, say, a hundred thousand vertices, your vertex shader, the program you have written, will be repeated, will be performed a hundred thousand times each frame, okay, to give you a chance to do these three operations for each vertex separately. Okay, so it's important to, to remember a vertex shader is uh, um, performing its um, for a single vertex. It's not like a uh, iteration through a number of vertices, it's just one. All right, and what it has to do? Uh, the vertex data is provided in the form of VBO. This is why I told you that VBO is a prerequisite for this lecture. Uh, VBO contains just the row 
coordinates x, y, z, but these are coordinates of the model. Okay, um, you will provide the transforms that allow to move this project, uh, sorry, this model, and locate it somewhere in the scene separately, and that text shader has to process has to transform these row coordinates using these transforms in order to uh, provide the information for the remaining part of the graphical pipeline. Moreover, the vertex shader will typically use uh, two or three such transforms. So uh, you learned about the model transform you used to locate, move the model to the desired position and orientation within the 3D scene. Then we have the view transform, which defines the position of the camera. And then we additionally have a projection uh, um, transformation, uh, which defines the perspective, uh, the uh, visibility con, and basically uh, the way in which the 3D scene is converted into 2D scene. Uh, you have implemented these uh, transforms previously in your first uh, practical exercise and we have discussed them quite quite a lot so I will not go into detail uh, right now I hope that these are this is stuff that you are should be familiar by now so this is the vertex transformation vertex transformation by those three uh, transforms model view and projection. Why I previously told you two or three transforms? Because in OpenGL quite often the model and view transforms are combined, so multiplied together to form the model view transform, which is a single transform. So it's either three model view projection or two model view and projection. Then the second stage here is lighting. If you have no light, you have no image. If without light, everything that you can see is total darkness, blackness. And this will be your experience when you first time um, implement uh, the programmable pipeline in your program. If you follow my instructions, uh, the first stage, the first effect you will see uh, will be total blackness. And this will be actually uh, showing you that you have started with your programmable pipeline and only then you will install lights okay so there is no such thing anymore as default lighting in OpenGL default lighting is deprecated we are not going to use it and even if you use a, a fixed function for lighting it's totally incompatible with shaders shaders will have absolutely no idea about all those fixed uh, lights that you set up in uh, the CPU program so just don't do that we'll do all the lighting on board of the uh, GPU in the vertex shader and uh, finally and please note that this lighting is calculated per vertex now so it's the light, uh, lighting uh, or shading value for the vertex. And the vertex shader will also calculate the texture coordinates, uh, but uh, this, into this we will be looking more detail when we discuss uh, textures later in this module. Then, uh, outside of the vertex, a part of this fixed uh, part of the pipeline, there's clipping, and rasterization, so the process of filling in the gaps in between vertices, uh, creating faces, triangular faces that form a, sh uh, a mesh. Okay, but this means that uh, OpenGL will create uh, small fragments or pixels. Okay, this is why Microsoft calls this next uh, shader the pixel shader, uh, because this shader will be called for each pixel of your image separately okay uh, attention here pixel is technically a picture element it's a element of a 2d picture if this is a pixel on a 3d surface of a 3d object uh, at least in terminology of OpenGL we will call them fragments but fragment is something that you intuitively feel it's nearly the same thing as a pixel. So yes, fragment shader will be separately called for each pixel, or we prefer to say fragment in your 3D scene. It may generate even millions of uh, executions per second. So as you can see, 
uh, we are talking here about uh, really, really huge numbers of program executions per frame, not to mention per second, okay? Because in each frame you have to uh, perform some operations for each vertex and perform some operations for each fragment. And what operations uh, are these? A uh, photonashly fragment shader can be very simplified. It can uh, do just copying input to output. So the first fragment shader you will create does virtually nothing. Uh, but what it can do, it can do texturing and can do uh, color calculations. Okay. Uh, the next slide actually provides a little bit more specific information about what uh, each of these shaders uh, is supposed to do. So in case of vertex shaders, these are vertex transformations, texture coding and generation, lighting calculation, color, color application, normal transformation. Some of these uh, have to be done, some of them are optional. Fragment shaders provide per pixel color, apply textures, per pixel fog, per pixel lighting. Some of these technologies like per pixel lighting are quite advanced, creating quite nice, uh, quite nice um, effects, okay? But one important uh, message here is all these happens really millions times per second. So firstly, your programs have to be well written, have to be short and effective. And also you can imagine how absolutely incredible efficiency does the GPU have. Okay, GPU is just amazingly fast and amazingly efficient. Without that, 3D graphics as we know it would be not possible. Okay, uh, here you can see some more uh, functions, um, special effects, things that you can uh, implement using shaders. This is just a, a short selection. So bump mapping, reflections, uh, mirrors, shadows, blending, you see in water rendering, fog rendering, this kind of stuff. Uh, but also algorithmic textures and something that's called GPGPU, uh, which is a topic that um, is beyond 3D graphics actually, because what the GPGPU stands for is General Purpose Computing on Graphics Processing Units. Um, this is, for example, NVIDIA's CUDA technology. Uh, what it really is, if you think about what I've just told, that uh, these uh, vertex shaders and uh, uh, fragment shaders tend to be performed uh, many thousands, if not millions times per second, and that the efficiency of the GPU is absolutely incredible, okay? then. I know that for us, for us gamers, there's nearly no world beyond the 3D graphics, but 3D graphics is not the only thing you can calculate, okay? So GPGPU is the technology to use this incredible efficiency, uh, incredible processing power of the graphics card, of the GPU, the heart of the graphics card, for applications that are not typical for this hardware, so for the applications that are not 3D rendering. And uh, two very interesting applications of GPGPU that are quite often used in uh, gaming technology are AI and physics. Okay, Both can uh, actually consume this incredible processing power of a graphics card and both also have something very special that, that the 3D graphics also has. Uh, they can use the potential of massive parallel architecture. Okay? In uh, 3D graphics, this massively parallel architecture means that 
um, the GPU can process many pixels at the same time, many vertices at the same time. Quite often, if you do a vertex operation on X, Y, Z coordinates, uh, calculation for X, calculation for Y, and calculation for Z will be done exactly in the same time in parallel. Okay, and similarly, um, some, uh, some, not all, but. Uh, some advanced uh, challenges in AI and in physics can use the same thing, so can be uh, done in a massively parallel environment. Moving on to uh, actually the final part of this uh, first part of the, of the shader lecture, so there is another part in a separate, uh, separate uh, recording, how to prepare a shader program. Okay, first of all, you have to write this uh, shader program and you will write it in GLSL. Uh, we will be talking, we will be looking into GLSL as a language in the next part, uh, big part of separately recorded part of this lecture. But for now, uh, it's OpenGL shading language, also known as GLS, GLS Lang, GLS Lang, yes, GLS Lang. And this is high level shading language based on C for programming on the GPU and it replaces the previous ARB assembly language. So you see how lucky you are. You don't have to program your shaders in assembly language anymore. This was my first attempt, historically my first attempt to write a, a shader and it was absolutely difficult, absolutely terrible and absolutely confusing. My first shader was written in the in an assembly language, okay? So then when um, high level shading languages appeared, there was such a revolution, it was really beautiful. Okay, so uh, programs for the shader, so for the uh, graphics card are prepared in text form, as C++ or anything like this, but unlike uh, most of the programming that you normally do, they will be compiled and linked in runtime. Okay, and this is mostly because compilation is performed by your graphics card drivers. And why is that? Why you cannot just have a GLSL compiler somewhere? Because the binaries that are produced are very strictly platform dependent. Okay, uh, you may have um, a particular NVIDIA GPU and if the version of NVIDIA is changed, your binaries can be incompatible. Okay, so that's, that's really, really very dependent on the uh, architecture you have in your graphics card. So it would be absolutely impossible to um, compile GLSL language and provide, for example, sell a game with all shaders already compiled. Uh, the recent uh, extensions in OpenGL allow for the binary executable to be pre-compiled and it also happens at the installation time. So uh, when you purchase the game, it's still not insta uh, not compiled. Okay, shaders are somewhere there in the source text format. Only when you install the game, uh, your uh, shaders can be compiled then and stored in the uh, binary format. We will not use this approach. Uh, we will store uh, shaders in the form of a text file and compile and link in runtime simply because it seems uh, to be a simpler uh, solution for us. Okay, we need to uh, change these uh, shaders on a very regular basis, so that's the best uh, best thing for us. All right, uh, you will be using in this module a library that was created specifically for this module. Its name is uh, 3DGO. It's quite small, but it contains um, some nice tool which make your life seriously easier when loading, compiling, linking and using shaders. So what you need to know about uh, using shaders? As you can see, the process is quite complex. It's eight steps uh, altogether. All right. So you first have to create shader objects. Uh, we will usually create two. 
one vertex shader, one fragment shader. Once you have them, these are objects, okay, C++ objects, in fact, uh, you have to load uh, the source code. Usually, you will, you, we will do it from a file, okay, not usually, in which module we will always read them from, from file, from a file, and uh, you have to load the source code to the shader object. Then you do the compilation, okay, for, to compile, uh, the shader object will use a specific function some, some, somehow located, somewhere located in the uh, graphics card drivers, and then you will create the program object. Program object is like a, uh, you know, the main program which will be connected or attached to each shader that you have created. So. Uh, we we'll start usually with creating just two shaders. So you have to attach your shaders, your vertex shader and your program shader, uh, sorry, and your vertex shader to the program object. Then there is the process of linking. Yes, shaders have to be linked. Um, I will explain what exactly linking is at some later stage, not, not now yet. And then we have to bind the program ready to use. If you remember our VBOs, we were binding VBOs, okay? Now we will bind programs. So we will specify uh, OpenGL, hello, this is the program I want to use. And this program contains uh, an attached fragment shader and vertex shader. And these uh, seven steps discussed so far uh, have to be done in the initialization stage, so in one go usually in the beginning of the program, and then in order to work with shaders you will have to send data, okay, various types of data to the shaders so that you actually start rendering something. And of course throughout the whole process you should check for, check for errors. Alright, so First of all, we will create a, a C3DGL program class object, object of the class C3DGL program. Uh, this class represents the program object, and uh, so creates the program object. And if you wonder why I'm starting from the step four of this procedure, the reason is very simple. This uh, GLSL program has to be defined as a global variable. So somewhere in top of your file, global variable, because it will have to be uh, mm, referred from various places in throughout uh, across your code. Okay, uh, so that's uh, that's uh, step number four. Now going back to step number one and all other steps. Uh, this code should appear in your initialization uh, function because this is something you should do only uh, once unless you want to redefine your shaders at some uh, later stage but in uh, this module you you will always do it in the beginning of the program execution in the initialization or init function so we will create two objects of the C3DGL shader class. One will be for the vertex shader, one for, will be for the fragment shader. Then they can be uh, defined as local variables inside the function uh, because firstly they will not be used outside of this function and also they don't have to uh, exist once they are used, attached to the program they've done the role, they can be automatically dissolved. Okay, so for each shaders we created, that's um, important stuff, okay, so create the vertex shader, load the source code from a file, please note that uh, this is the uh, path to the, the rational path to the uh, source file, and it's called basic.vert that is uh, our standard extension for the vertex shader. And uh, then we have the compilation. Okay? Um, this uh, if return false, it is uh, the procedure of checking errors. So each of these functions will return false in case we had any error and it will also display a short message in your terminal window, this black window you are working with. 
Uh, it's important to notice that um, all these functions create load from file compile are the GLSL uh, uh, functions, so functions coming from your module library. Uh, if you were to program it directly in OpenGL, this call would be much longer and much more complicated. Um, then we repeat a similar three line code for the fragment shader, and then we create pr the program attach the vertex shader to this program, attach the fragment shader for, to this program, link, and use this. Use is the same thing as binding, okay? So binding a program is called using a program. And that's um, everything you have to do to start with shaders, and as I mentioned previously, to see the darkness of your new image. All right, now, the next step is to send data to shaders, and uh, uh, this slide is quite crucial. Okay? I will probably come back to this slide at some stage uh, later on, uh, because uh, I have some concerns about uh, uh, the attention span of some of the listeners, and what I'm going to do to talk about right now it's absolutely crucial piece of information if you want to program shaders in the future. So basically, for the GPU program, for the shader to be usable, you have to send some data to this program. And these the data come in two flavors. One are so-called so uniform variables. These are various things that you want to use to configure your shader program. They will be sent directly from the application to the shader and they will remain constant for at least a single primitive, so for a, a series of vert vertices and a series of, um, of um, pixels, uh, fragments, sorry. Uh, examples, all the transformation matrices that we send over to the shaders are the uniform variables all the information about the material light okay of course they can be hard coded in the shader uh, but usually you want to set up this light from your cpp from your c++ code from your cpu code okay and if you want to set up anything transformation is a must all right uh, but well written uh, shader program should be config uh, should be it should be possible to configure this program by sending the light parameters material parameters and so on and this is what we uh, need the uniform variables for so uniform variables are the data that you sent over there. and then we have vertex attributes Vertex attributes are the data provided on per vertex basis. And uh, these uh, vertex attributes include things like vertex coordinates, normals, and a few other stuff like vertex colors, texture coordinates, vertex bending factors, anything else, okay? But uh, from these first two, vertex coordinates and normals, you can uh, guess actually that these are the VBOs, okay? So vertex attributes are the data sent via the VBO, the vertex buffer object. So basically how it happens, you send these VBOs, quite often you would send several VBOs, for example, one for vertex coordinates, one for normals, one perhaps for texture coordinates, and then it will be sliced, okay? That will be taken one item from one buffer, one item from another buffer, one item from yet another buffer, depending on the number of VBOs you have set up and bound, and uh, just a single piece from each, uh, uh, from each buffer. So uh, the data for a single vertex will be used and send for uh, what we call an instance of the uh, vertex shader. Instance is one execution, a single execution of the vertex shader. So the first time the vertex shader is uh, running, it will get uh, one set XYZ of vertex coordinates, one set of uh, XYZ coordinates for normals, 
one set of 2D coordinates for the textual coordinates if we are using them, okay, for a single vertex. And then the process will repeat for every consecutive vertex until all the data that is to be rendered in the, the, in the buffers are completed, are rendered. But how it looks like from uh, the programming side, from the uh, C++ code? Let's start with the uniform variables. Uh, uniform variables have a human readable name, such as material, um, diffuse color, diffuse light, uh, model transform, or model ma matrix, whatever, okay? Human readable name. And the location. The location is a number, and you typically don't know about the location, because sending data to a uniform is a two-stage process. In the first stage, you obtain the location, so a numeric identifier of the uh, uniform, from its name. So you just ask, uh, uh, OK, OpenGL, um, uh, the uh, uniform variable uh, named projection matrix, uh, which location it would be. And uh, uh, OpenGL replies, uh, it's uh, 42. Okay, so that's uh, that's how, the, how it works. And then you send the data to a location. So this is, uh, you know, the human readable names are important because this is how you name these uh, uniform variables in your shader code. Okay, so it's a, a very nice uh, feature when you can use this human readable name in your C++ code in order to send uh, to send your data over to the shader. But so this uh, location is here as an optimization. So when you really send the data and you can send this data on a very uh, frequent uh, way. Uh, then you should rather store internally in your program, store the location and use this location because uh, uh, this will, uh, this is just faster. Okay, I I hope I don't have to explain why. Uh, all this is greatly simplified if you are using 3DGL, our uh, module library, because the location is obtained behind the scenes, hiding all the complexity of this uh, process. So, for example, this is a, a instruction to send the material color, red, green, blue parameters, so 0 0.6 of red, 0 0.6 of green, 0 0.6 of blue. This is a kind of a, a darkish gray color. And this uh, triple value, triple float number, a vector, 3D vector, will be sent to a uniform called material. And behind the scenes, the 3DGL will check the location name, um, sorry, the, the location number, the location code, and use this location code. And don't worry, it's done quite effectively because 3DGL is caching all those location names. Um, so it doesn't uh, do any excessive operations in communication with the shaders. It's 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 quite fine. So feel free to to use this uh, functionality. Uh, also, uh, this uh, send uniform function will check if you send the proper data. So there will be some uh, elementary basic checks. First of all, if there is a uniform under the name material, and if uh, uh, the data type that you are sending is correct. So this is something even beyond the standard, uh, san standard functionality in OpenGL, uh, because how OpenGL, uh, native OpenGL uh, processes uh, uniform variables, it's quite tricky. Uh, okay, so I think I've done quite a good job in providing this this function to you. Uh, in fact, um, OpenGL has over 30 different functions to operate on uniform variables, and you get just one, but overloaded with uh, multiple multiple formats. So. 
uh, send one floating point number like a fog factor here you are send you new fog factor 0 0.02 send one integer number of lights five here you are send three floats so a three dimensional vector uh, another uh, overloaded form of the same function you can also send entire matrix which is quite uh, quite important in uh, 3d graphics uh, programming so this is uh, this is about sending the uniform variables uh, the second the other category of uh, data to be sent over to the graphics card are vertex attributes so data provided on per vertex basis uh, in this case uh, they are somewhat similar because you also have the, the uh, attribute location that you can get from the uh, human readable name and then you send data to that uh, location but it is uh, a little bit different in case of vertex attributes and again 3dgl made the process quite straightforward so first of all uh, this is how you can ask for the location for the given uh, vertex attributes so uh, we complete we collect here uh, the attributes for a vertex and a normal these are two attributes of the vertex of course we, we are, they coordinate to the vertex coordinates sorry they uh, correspond to the vertex coordinates and the normal coordinates and we can store these uh, locations at um, a variable two variables to be correct okay vertex attributes are about sending the VBOs, the vertex buffer objects, to render. And this is uh, what we are looking at, uh, just double checking. Yes, this is uh, the VBO plus fixed pipeline. So this is the program, uh, this is the rendering, so a part of the render function. Uh, in shader technology, we don't have, you don't have to do any modifications to the initiation to sending buffers to, to uh, VBOs to the shader are uh, only modifications that we will be uh, that we will need to do are here in the rendering code and this is the old style rendering so it uses uh, VBOs but it uh, uses VBOs in conjunction with the fixed pipeline and we will just need a few small modifications to this uh, fixed uh, uh, fixed code first modification before I show first modification I will go back one slide and just remind you that uh, we keep uh, the location of the two vertex attributes the vertex and the normal as attrib vertex and attrib normal and now going back to this uh, VBO plus fixed pipeline the first change is with uh, GL enable client state function in a uh, fixed pipeline uh, we had this function that could enable vertex arrays and normal arrays okay there were two special parameters here no such thing any longer in the shader programming shader programming does not specify that you should send vertex array or a normal array yes this is most usually the case in 99% I'm not sure how, how many times but in, in, in what percentage of, of cases but in overwhelming majority of 3d scenes you will want to send vertex vertex coordinates and normal coordinates to your shaders uh, but uh, this is not always the case and even in this module uh, one day will arrive to quite exciting uh, shaders that model uh, particle systems like uh, rain, snow, smoke, fire, this kind of stuff. And uh, they are completely unorthodox. So they won't, in some cases, they don't take uh, vertex coordinates because all the vertex coordinates are calculated algorithmically in uh, the vertex shader and they also don't take normal array right so it's uh, it's now totally flexible so we don't need this gl enable client state 
instead we have GL enable vertex attribute array, a little bit longer name, and uh, not anymore a uh, constant value like GL vertex array, GL normal array. We use the attributes, the uh, attribute location values that we have acquired in the previous slide. Okay, attribute vertex, attribute normal. So the point here to understand is we as the developers programmers we understand that attribute vertex is the vertex coordinates attribute normal is the normal coordinates but uh, OpenGL is now totally agnostic of this fact OpenGL is not interested uh, OpenGL says whatever you want just send a packet in the VBO tell me what the location code and I will send it over to the to the graphics card and then this is only the responsibility of your shader program what you will do with vertex coordinates what you will do with normal coordinates okay total flexibility and total freedom uh, the next thing that you need to change is of course um, disable arrays so we will now use the gl disable vertex attribute array and you have to provide attribute vertex attribute normal and uh, is there anything else that we have to change of course there is uh, we still have deprecated functions here called gl vertex pointer and gl normal pointer and i've just told you that um, uh, the programmable pipeline is agnostic we never know or uh, contrary we know but OpenGL doesn't know what we are sending so there's no point to have a GL vertex pointer anymore we now have GL vertex actually pointer function okay uh, this GL vertex actually pointer has to specify the which uh, uh, attribute location we want to use uh, that we will be using uh, triplets of GL floats and uh, that's it okay I, I will not explain at this moment what uh, GL false uh, means and zero zero uh, it's basically start of the uh, of the buffer of the VBO buffer the, these uh, parameters were already available here in uh, GL uh, vertex pointer function and a similar change to the GL normal pointer please note that this time we have to specify that the normal is a triple GL float okay and again from the beginning of the buffer and you know what it's done okay this is VBO with shaders so uh, the uh, rendering code which is here binding the indices and drawing elements there is absolutely no change here so the code is uh, reasonably similar uh, some changes in the functions to reflect a new flexibility total flexibility of this uh, programmable pipeline solution but most often you will use simple tools available in 3d GL library so whilst I want you to understand the underlying uh, details that I've just presented in most cases you will just create a 3D model a C3DG model for example a teapot of course what else uh, this is what you need to load it from a 3D file and automatically initialize the VBOs so I think that you are, should be by now familiar with the load function and if you are not this means you should quickly go back to your uh, recipe to your workshop activity and create your first 3d scene okay and uh, uh, the 3dgl library uh, is uh, as a standard using the vbos and then we render uh, to render with shaders you don't have to change anything in 3dgl code because the 3d the 3dgl code will internally check whether you are using shaders or not and will choose the correct code to process uh, rendering so the code that uh, that i've just presented okay so it looked complex but fortunately with the 3dgl library it's not so complex after all 
It's all you need to know about preparing shader programs for years. It may be a lot to absorb, but it will all become more logical when you try it yourself and get your first 3D scene rendered in the programmable pipeline, all chances are you already have. Moving on to the GLSL language, but this will be the second part of this lecture. For now, I thank you for watching and invite to the shader technology part 2.